Ben Nicholson Smith of Sportsnet of Sportsnet.ca joins us now. Apparently, the ratings for my show were not great last week. Everyone just missed Ben that everything you put in your article yesterday, you we talked about on the show. You you brought to the table here. You brought the heat on Jay's Talk Plus with all these Alec Manoa details. Uh, but I guess let's do it again, uh, man. What? What what the heck, man? This is uh your your piece was I guess first of all, good morning. How are you doing? Uh, hey Blake, good. <laughs> yeah, doing well. Good to be talking with you. How's it going? I'm good. I'm fired up. Uh, so look, we're gonna talk about last night's game. It is obviously the more relevant and acute story right now, and the Blue Jays are in a playoff race that Alec Manoa is separate from. And obviously, Alec Manoa being separate from this playoff race is kind of the story uh, of the Blue Jay season. Um, but there was a scenario where a month ago when he got optioned to AAA initially, we thought, well, hey, if the Jays need him, if someone gets hurt, if there's a doubleheader day, Alec Manoa would be really good AAA depth. I, I know we talked about it a little bit on the show last week, but you had this piece go up yesterday. What has the last, how has the last month unfolded such that not only is Manoa not depth if they needed him now, but we're not going to see him throw a pitch at any competitive level in 2023 anymore. Yeah, it would be a real, real shock if he's able to get off a mound. Pretty much the people I'm talking to don't expect that to happen. So his season effectively is done. And uh, yeah, that's obviously not ideal by any stretch. And the Blue Jays, it's funny how these things work sometimes because, as you know, Blake, I mean, sometimes you'll hear stuff and you have a pretty good sense of it a few weeks before you can, you know, officially publish something or share something publicly. And so, you know, behind the scenes, from what I've been able to gather, this has been the case for a while now that it was pretty unlikely that Manoa was going to be able to, um, pitch again this year and that that was going to happen. And so, you know, yesterday I was able to get to the point that in talking to people who are pretty close to the situation, have a good read on it, that, you know, that's, it's essentially that that ship has sort of sailed. He's not going to pitch again this year, barring a big reversal. Um, but yeah, there are all kinds of layers to this and we can get into them, but it, you know, it's really essentially he wanted to go through some medical testing. Um, you know, the team was supportive in, um, in in those endeavors to make sure that he was getting tested medically he had a couple follow-ups last week um there is nothing structural there is nothing that will require surgery as far as i understand it um but manoa hasn't felt as though he's at a point that he can compete physically and felt that rest and recuperation would be the best path i mean that's what the actions tell us right he hasn't been pitching he's had the opportunity to um so there are some physical concerns and and look, the, the consequences of this have a, have a chance to reach pretty far. Um, so we'll see where those go. And uh, in the meantime, the Blue Jays do not have their opening day starter as they proceed here in this pennant race. So obviously we have to be aware uh, of what Manoa is reporting about his body physically, right? Like we, we can't, you know, throw that aside. We can't be reckless uh, about a player's health, whether it's physical or mental. However... The Blue Jays have operated this last month plus as if they don't think there's maybe they don't not think there's an injury, but they haven't placed him on the IL. And as you and I discussed last week, if he was hurt, he would probably he his camp or, or the union or someone like that would file some sort of grievance or really push the Jays to put him on the IL because he's not accumulating service time right now. And he's not accumulating uh, or he's not being paid a major league salary right now. He's not on the IL, which when it comes to this kind of thing means you're probably healthy enough to pitch through it. So acknowledging that, you know, I don't know how Alec Manoa feels right now physically, but the fact that he's had about a month of, of these tests and, and follow-up appointments and second and third opinions, and there's still not enough to even put him on the IL. How do you think that that is being received from the Blue Jays. And I don't mean the front office because that's a whole separate thing that might have a long-term impact. But I mean, if you're one of those guys that has dealt with being a part of the four man rotation or has picked, pitched extra innings out of the bullpen, or, you know, has been up and down to triple a and asked to be stay ready at times, Alec Manoa is a part of this team and has basically by, by doing this, the way it seems to me is taken himself out of the mix to potentially help the Blue Jays in a playoff race where every little bit of help could count. Like we don't know that guys are going to make it all the way healthy. We don't know that there won't be uh, you know, a double header day. We don't know that game one sixty two won't be a meaningless one where they could just use someone to sop up some innings. How has this been received 
the, from how you can tell in the clubhouse with Manoa, you know, more or less taking himself out of the mix to help this team down the stretch. Yeah, this is an, one of the really interesting layers to it, right? And the players, uh, you know, as far as the the whole conversation around Manoa from the moment he was optioned until now, I mean, their focus has been on the game in front of them and on and on their own job, which is pretty significant. Um, my understanding, though, is that this has been obviously noticed by the players in that room. They are well aware of the fact that Alec Manoa has been optioned to AAA. They are well aware of the fact that he has not pitched to AAA. They know he opened the season for them. He was a Cy Young finalist last year. So even if players aren't talking about it publicly, they are well aware of this. They're talking about it behind the scenes with each other, um, with their agents. Um, these are conversations that occur around all major league clubhouses, including with the Toronto Blue Jays. Now, I'm not saying it's like some huge distraction. They also talk about their fantasy football teams. They also talk about their batting stances and all kinds of other things. And this is one thing among many. I'm not saying that this is like front of mind for everyone. But yeah, I I don't think this is going to improve Manoa's standing within that room. And in fact, I think that there's going to be at a certain point next spring, assuming he is back with the Blue Jays, which is you know, uh, you know, well, that's the working <laughs> assumption at this point. Um, assuming he's back with the Blue Jays, there will probably be some fences to mend, I would think. Because as you said, there are players in this team who have absolutely put it all on the line. And the four-man rotation is a perfect example of that. The rotation has held this team together all season long without a lot of contributions from Alec Manoa. So as I said, the players are well aware of this. Um, and... Uh, they're not, I haven't heard anyone really address it publicly, um, but that doesn't mean that they aren't well aware of exactly what's transpired. And I'm sure some of them have their thoughts about it. Yeah, it's probably not the the coolest thing you can do as a teammate. And again, there's the element of he feels how he feels. So let's take the individual centric look at this now and think about, okay, he shut down. The team is going to acquiesce and, and let him focus on getting back to where he needs to be physically and health wise. Uh, I would imagine a, there is an awful lot of pressure on showing up to spring training day one, 2024 being ready to go and looking pretty, pretty damn good. If you've kind of shut yourself down here. Um, but if you're the blue Jays, when it comes to Alec Manoa's 2024 role, how are you been penciling him in? This is a team that has Hyunjin Ryu, who is going to be a free agent. The other four starters all under contract, but it's also an organization that doesn't have a lot of major league ready starting pitching depth. Bowden Francis could maybe shift back to a starter role. He's been valuable in the valuable in the bullpen. We, we can see there um, at the AAA level, you know, Mitch White's been a tiny bit better lately, but Ricky Tiedemann has not pitched a lot of innings. Most of their interesting starting pitching prospects are at double A and below. Can this team go into the off season thinking Manoa is going to be a part of their five man rotation? Or has this situation gotten too muddy where you kind of have to take an even longer look at depth than we would have anticipated? Well, I think there are a couple layers to this. One is the performance side and then two is the relationship side and unfortunately for the Blue Jays and Manoa neither one of those is in a great spot if you look at the performance there's there are legitimate reasons that he was optioned to the minor leagues his performance was not good this year and if you look at the underlying metrics if you look at the ERA I, mean, I don't have to tell you Blake I mean the, I don't have to tell anyone listening we all saw it we all know he did not perform well this year so that's not going to inspire a ton of confidence when it comes to what he might be able to do in 2024. So even if we only look at performance, he is the kind of starter that you would say on a good team, he should be competing for a spot in the major league rotation. And if he doesn't make the major league rotation, he goes to AAA, he's depth, he comes up at some point. So that is from a pure performance lens, how I would look at it. Now, there is the relationship side too. So Pete Walker, Right, We all saw the clip. John Schneider, Pete Walker, Alec Manoa, spring training 2023. They are telling him that he has made the team and it is this really great moment. It's on social media. Everyone's excited about it. Now, I, I've asked Pete Walker about it. I haven't had a conversation. He, he declined to speak to me about it, which is totally fine. Um, but, you know, I don't think that Pete Walker is thrilled with the developments here. Okay, like I'm going to go on a limb there. Um, I don't think that the coaching staff as a whole is thrilled. Like I said, with the clubhouse, 
And in fact, like they're not thrilled. I think we can say that pretty, pretty definitively. And so what does that mean? How does that get repaired? And this is where like, for as much as we love the stats and the numbers and the, you know, seam shifted wake and everything like that, (laughs) what does it look like for this relationship to get repaired? And that is a question. There've been a ton of conversations that like, this hasn't been a month of silence, right? In the, in this whole process, there've been a ton of conversations between the player and the team and who knows where this goes, right? Like it, there's there's still more conversations to go. And there are a lot of reasons for everyone involved to get on the same page and somehow to get aligned and to make sure that they're pushing in the same direction again. But I don't I think that that will require some work and some finesse and some real relationship skills from one direction or another. And I don't know what form that takes. It's a, it's a tough one to figure. So Ben, something you mentioned a little earlier is sometimes we hear stuff like this and it takes us a little bit to put enough reporting together where it's solid enough to, to go with it. And then someone in our role also has to, especially on the writing side, where you have a little bit more time to build it out, we have to be cognizant of, well, one side is going to have incentive to tell a story one way. The other side is going to have incentive to tell a story another way. And look, I'm I'm more than happy when the situation calls for it, the starting pitching depth entering the season, the lack of acquiring an extra bat at the trade deadline, some of the, you know, lineup or or pitching change decisions, stuff like that. I am, it's like a huge chunk of this job is nitpicking what a a GM or a manager or front office do. But in this case, I'm a little at a loss for what the Blue Jays could have done better with this Manoa situation where they let him go down to the complex league and work his way back up. And it was pretty quick enough that, you know, he hadn't, there was a small window there where if he had been good the rest of the way, he might've even still kept super two eligibility. It wasn't entirely likely, but there was a small possibility there. They give him another crack at the rotation. He doesn't succeed. They try to send him down. I don't, obviously we're not behind the closed doors, but from what we can see, was there a, way that they could have handled Manoa from a performance and and what to do with that performance perspective better. Let's leave aside the PR and optics handling of it because that's a a separate thing, but how they've actually handled Manoa do like, where do you land on that one? Because I'm, I'm happy to, to nitpick where it's there, but I don't know what you could have done differently when the guy just hasn't performed and you're trying to make the postseason. Yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately, the player is going to be the driving force in their career more so than the support staff, more so than the team, more so than an agent or a teammate or anyone around them. Um, it's going to be player driven. So, yeah, I think could the Blue Jays have done something better? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they could have. Um, I think this this is not a good result. Like whatever whatever you think about how it unfolded. You don't want to have your opening day starter not pitch after August the 10th or August the 11th. Not a good result. So I'm sure there are things they could have done better. I'm not sure exactly what those things are. So I'm not going to sit here, you know, behind the microphone and say I know exactly what those things are. Um, I think it would be it would be pretty close minded to say that they couldn't have done anything better um, because, you know, you always want to get the most out of your players. And that's clearly not happening right here. But I do think ultimately when it comes to a player um, I, I think Alec Manoa, yeah, he might say he, and I don't know this um, for a fact, but he might say that he wished the Blue Jays would have handled things differently. But ultimately, it's on Manoa to be the driving force behind his own career. And so the results, those are, he's the one who's throwing those pitches. He's the one who is making some of these decisions. And there are definitely physical issues that are involved here. Um, not injuries, like I said, but they're physical issues. But at the same time, one way or another, a player is responsible for the numbers and for the production that they end up with. So um, I think that anyone in this situation, and and certainly Alec Manoa, there has to be accountability here. And maybe there hasn't been enough of that in the eyes of some. In fact, you know, I've heard from people on the Jays side that think there's not enough accountability from Alec Manoa in this situation. And so we'll see where that goes. But there is, you know, there's room for repair here. Um, but that'll require some real skill because I don't think it's automatic as to what that looks like. It's a, it's a tough one. Uh, so Ben, if we recontextualize what Manoa season has meant, look, compared to last year, that is a 4.5 swing in wins above replacement. Now this isn't the, you know, this isn't how the, the wins and losses actually work, but let's play out the, the example here. That's a 4.5 swing in wins. 
Vladimir Guerrero's drop off has been about a, a two win drop off as well. So we're talking six and a half wins. If the Jays were six and a half games better in the standings, it would be weird because it would mean they won half a game. Uh, they would also still be in basically the same spot. They'd be in wild card two, but they would be competing with the Rays and the Orioles still for the division. When you look at the entire season, look, they've had great health until very, very recently. Every member of the starting rotation, except for Manoa, has been as good as they could have hoped or better. They have a top five bullpen in baseball, last night's blips uh, aside. When you look at where they're at and, and how we're talking about this team and their inability to you know, sustain a, a big run or, or really look like one of the best teams in baseball for any stretch of time, is it as simple as, hey, you got six and a half fewer wins from your best young pitcher and your best young hitter? Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair way to look at it. Um, you know, I think that to me, I look at a collective lack of power um, as the big difference on this team, especially just considering how good their pitching staff is, as you've said. Um, so, uh, you know, we've seen flashes from George Springer and, and from Vlad Jr. in the last few days that are encouraging. But I still look at a team where the team leader has 21 homers and probably is trending toward 23, 24 on the season. That's pretty, that's pretty low. Like that's really low. They're 18th in team. total home runs. Yeah. I mean, that's, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's even more striking when you just look at the, like, who's your big threat. Who's the threat that's going to, that's going to really strike fear into opposing managers and relievers and starters. And I, I don't see that on this team. So um, I, I, I think that, Manoa, I think they've actually bounced back from that pretty well because they've had probably more than you would have expected from Ryu. I think Vlad Jr. has had a better season than War would suggest. I mean, I think he's actually like chronically undersold by War because he posts so much. And I think I think the defensive metrics are way too hard on him, um, mm -hmm. to be honest. But um, but uh, yeah, I think that it's a fair read at the same time to say that both Vlad Jr. and Alec Manoa fell well short of probably where we would have expected them. There's no question about that. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you and I disagree on the, the Vlad season there a little bit maybe. And then that's probably a conversation for end of season when we're, you know, doing the, either the postmortem or the celebration either way, I, maybe we won't nitpick with Vlad if they win the world series. Cause I'd imagine that would mean he, he turned a corner <laughs> at some point. Uh, but yeah, that's a convo for uh, another day, but I think you're right that the lack of power there is pretty noticeable and you play a Rangers team yesterday that yeah they only did it with two home runs but you've got pitchers having to nibble a little bit because Semyon and Seager and Lowe are such big home run threats I mean Mitch Garver's turned into a home run threat now lately and then it's like oh yeah you get to the bottom third of the order and there's Jonah Heim who uh who is also pretty good uh with the long ball as far as catchers go so that game yesterday Ben there's a lot we can we can do with it. We've used most of our time on the Manoa thing here, which I, I think is fair, um, but wanted your take on the decision to let Chris Bassett go back out, uh, given the way things had gone for him in the the couple of innings prior. And this is, again, a nitpicky thing where if Bassett executes better or Yenis' Cabrera is a little bit better or the bats come around, maybe it's not that big a deal. Um, but to me, and I know this is something you and I have talked about when we're at games together before, it's the, the I, I can't I can't predict game to game if a pitcher is going to be allowed to go back out for, say, the sixth inning. And I, I think when we look at things, hey, how have the first five innings gone? Where are you in the lineup? What does that part of the lineup look like? How many pitches have you thrown? Is there hard contact? Things like that. We should be able to predict pretty well if a guy's going back out there. What did you think of Bassett being left out there, especially coming on the heels of in a very similar situation and a situation where I'd argue Kikuchi had an even better case to go back out. He did not go back out in a game last week, and that one kind of backfired as well. Yeah, it's an interesting call. I, I'm fine with it. Um, it obviously backfired. And if you could go back in time, you you undo that, of course. Um, I, I'm okay with it, just given that it was middle to back of the order. Um, you know, you're facing Garver, Grossman, and Leody Tavares. <clears throat> Presumably, you're going to trust Chris Bassett against those guys. Certainly, if you're going to make a run to the ALCS or the World Series, Chris Bassett's going to have to get out hitters who are better than Robbie Grossman and Leody Tavares. <laughs> and, you know, it just didn't happen this time. So I'm okay with it. Um, I think progressively, as we get closer to the end of the season, um, and or anytime you're approaching an off day, for example, um, which the Blue Jays don't have until Monday, 
it, you know, like on Saturday and Sunday, you got to be more aggressive with your bullpen, knowing that you have that off day coming up. And on a day like this, where you're in the middle of, you know, 10 games in 10 days, maybe you have to lean on your starter just a little bit more as much as these games are huge. Um, you're also balancing the long term and the short term. So I get it when I was watching it unfold in real time, I wasn't questioning it. So I'm not inclined to say that that was a huge error um, by the Blue Jays. I think if you're looking at errors, Chris Bassett made one running over to third base. Or yeah. Rivera made one waving home Kevin Kiermeyer. Like there were definitely mistakes made in the game by the Blue Jays, but I'm okay with that call. Okay. I just wanted your take on it. And, and, you know, I, I go back and forth on it a, a little bit as well. I tend to be more of a, let your guys go out and pitch through it. Um, kind of guy in general, despite what the, the numbers might say. Um, but yeah, the, it, just coming on the heels of when they made the opposite decision in a similar spot. Um, consistency is what I'm looking for uh, there a little bit. But like you said, there there was a reasonable case to be made. A couple quick ones for you, Ben, before we let you go. Uh, ben, Brandon Bell comes out of that game last night with back spasms. He had missed a handful of games with a back issue, a handful of games with an illness, a handful of games with a back issue. Um, I believe he would have been basically done an IL stint almost like as of today, if they had just sat him down, uh, do you think that that's, I, I know we're expecting to get an update pregame today, but given how that's all gone and that it's a back for a guy in his mid to late thirties, um, do you, do you, is it kind of on your radar that he might need an IL stint here? Yeah, I think it's on the radar. Um, cause it could allow you to bring somebody else up. I mean, maybe it's uh, as simple as a Mason McCoy, you know, who knows uh, what that corresponding move would be, but if Belt isn't going to be able to go in the next few days, then I think there is a pretty strong case just to IL him. And then ideally, he's able to recover fully and then he's back for the wild card round. He's back for the final weekend of the series um, and you can use him in those situations. But, you know, in the meantime, they're probably going to have to rely and continue relying on a guy like Spencer Horwitz who came in and got a big pinch hit hmm. just yesterday. Or Kevin Biggio will keep playing a lot. And I thought Kevin Biggio quietly probably had his best game of the season. Um, I know he had a walk-off home run, so we'll say it's in, <laughs> among his best games. He also of the had a game-winning hit by pitch. So yeah, true. He's, so he's had, had some big ones. Yeah, he's had some clutch moments. But, but I, I do, I did want to talk about Kevin Biggio uh, front pivoting from the belt thing because look, if Belt, let's say Belt doesn't need the the IL, it's just something that he'll he'll feel better about today. Matt Chapman could be back this weekend. You look at this team, and if you draw the cutoff around the the All Star break. And yeah, arbitrary endpoints, but that's a good little, like almost two month stretch of play here. And you filter this team by who's been getting on base the most, who's been doing the most damage at the plate. It is the guys who two months ago, we would have thought were the obvious guys getting squeezed for playing time here. Kevin Biggio has the fourth best on base percentage in the American league in the second half of the season among qualified hitters. Like that's, that's the level Kevin Biggio has been on. And I know there's not, it hasn't been crazy uh, amounts of power and the OPS isn't like a thousand or anything like that, but he has been pretty steady and he's filled in at a couple spots. Davis Schneider would be first in OBP in the second half of the season. If he had enough plate appearances to qualify, they're going to get Matt Chapman back at some point. Brandon belt is around here, man. How, how tough is the job John Schneider has here to manage this as a meritocracy because every game matters so much while also, Hey, Whit Merrifield and Matt Chapman, who maybe haven't made the best cases for everyday plate appearances are also your kind of vets and leader guys. How do you manage that this next little bit? Or does everyone have to kind of put ego aside and the hot guys are going to play? I think you just go with the best options on any given day. And we saw Whit Merrifield, not in the starting lineup yesterday, I think that's fine. I think when Matt Chapman comes back and you know he's he's re recovered from his finger to the point that he can play, great, but you're still going to want some rest days, I think, for Matt Chapman. Um, so he can play, uh, he can be on the bench here and there. Um, I think Bo Bichette uh, is going to DH occasionally. We're going to see Vlad Jr. in there every single day. Um, we're going to see... I mean, David Schneider is going to be in there most days, but I think you can mix and match. I really think it's fine. And with a guy like Biggio or Santiago Espinal, they've really used them in such a way that they kind of split up games. And Espinal faces a lot of the lefties. Biggio faces a lot of the righties. It's worked out pretty nicely for them in that way. So I don't really see a crunch coming necessarily, especially because with Jansen Hurt, 
you're not using the DH spot for Kirk ever. And then if Belt is also sidelined, the DH spot is going to be open basically every single day, allowing you to use different guys in that role. 